John, before we get to talking about what makes a virtual event remarkable, I would love to know how you first came to realize that this is what you really love to do and want to make your life's work. You know, it's uh, that is a fantastic question. I mean, it's not maybe not the best story, but it is a fantastic question. Um, so I actually have a degree in elementary education and a minor in business. And I started working for a company out of college that was helping schools fundraise. And they would do it through fitness type events, like a pep rally event and then a fitness event. And so in the course of that job, I actually met my now boss who was already, he was working in that company also. And he was the vice president of experience. He was a general manager. Um, he had a couple of different roles and he uh, started this company Elevate and casted vision for it. Say, hey, yeah, we're gonna help people and organizations live and lead at a higher level, which is still our vision as a company today. And uh, he said that we're gonna do that through corporate events, through nonprofit events, through school events. We work with local high schools and local school districts even here in the Atlanta area. And it's just been fun. It's, uh, I, people have asked me like, hey, what's your origin story? And I trace it back to, I grew up in Florida. And in Florida, I lived on about 13 acres and it was on the lake. And whenever we would go, uh, whenever it would be like 4th of July weekend or Labor Day weekend, my family was just who we were. We would have friends over for those weekends. But in order to do that, you had to get ready for all your guests, right? So we would spend hours like using the leaf blower to clean off the patio and get it cleaning, washing and scrubbing the boats and getting all the life jackets out. And then people would come over and we would have a good time in the lake and I would teach people how to wakeboard and water ski. And so it's the hospitality of it and the event side of it, it really translates into what we do now, which is we spend days and hours and just going through and preparing and planning for attendees, for the guests to arrive. We want them to have a good time and we want them to learn something, which is still what I do today. And then um, afterwards we do the cleaning up and. It's, it's interesting thinking back to how I grew up and it's just kind of ingrained in me. I was thinking what a blast it sounded like until you got to the cleaning up part. I'm sure that's not quite as much fun as the rest. It's, it's always a blast until you have to clean up from the aftermath. You know, <laughs> of course, you had the people that would stay and help and, and do that kind of thing. But yeah, it's it's just fun to think about. And it really is a passion. There's there is nothing like so. Um, I, and again, like my origin story is not and especially for elevate we did not start off as a virtual events company we started off as an in-person events company and then when the pandemic hit we started doing virtual events like a lot of companies because that's the only way that we that we could survive and so we've gotten to a point now where we we feel like we're pretty good at it our, our clients give us some good feedback sometimes not so good because there's just so many things you can control in the events world and tack on new technology it is just challenging for anyone but um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun because when when the audience is there and the guests are there, whether it's students or teachers or whether it's um, business professionals, whoever it is, if there is a crowd and they're there, they're learning something new and they're having a good time at the same time, I'm like, I'm just on cloud nine. So it's it's a lot of fun. I wish you'd take me back in your imagination to your first virtual event. What do you remember very best about doing that when the pandemic hits? Now you've got to go virtual. What is that yeah. like? You know, uh, very, very challenging. So the actual first, so it's funny, the very first virtual event I ever did was a virtual webinar. I planned it and I had a whole script for it. I, I didn't really promote it. Um, it was a webinar. Two people registered. One was my wife and only one person showed up and it was my wife. And But what's interesting is then when the pandemic hit, I already knew how to use the system, how to build the platform, how to use the platform. And then um, our very first paid virtual event was from a longtime client. They We've done events with them for eight or nine years now. And they were just like everybody else were, so they're, well, maybe not like everybody else, but they were like everybody else in the fact that they used to do events in person, they couldn't do it anymore. And so uh, what they said is, hey, this is brand new to our team. They're an apartment community organization based out of Atlanta and they have apartment communities literally all over the country. And they said, we wanna do town hall style for about 30 to 45 minutes. We want people to have a good time to learn something and to hear updates 
from the leadership of our company because there's so many things that are changing. And so I can't remember if it was the first one or the second one, but we actually, so it was myself and Billy, just the two of us in a studio, a little smaller than this, and one camera, one computer, and we accidentally swiped, like there was a key command where like we swiped with like two or three fingers on the mouse pad and it went to like backwards on the browser and it locked us out of the event. There was like 250 people in the event watching and it locked us out for about five minutes. We couldn't get in. And it's just the two of us and we're like, oh gosh, like what did we, what did we do, what happened? And so it's, it's funny thinking back to where we were then and where we are now and we've learned a lot. What in the world did you do when that locked you out for five minutes? Well, it was it would it would be like hitting the back button, like to go backwards on the website, because it was a web-based one. It wasn't like Zoom. Zoom. Zoom is one where, where like the app is installed on your computer. This one was you would go to like a website, and that's what the event was held on. And so we accidentally we were trying to go backwards in the slides, and we accidentally went backwards in the website, and it locked us out to where like we had to like r completely restart the computer and then boot it back up again and then come back. And thankfully, they, they still hired us to do, that was like the second out of a series of 10 different events that we did, but we learned the hard way to disable that function on the computers. <laughs> I hope we haven't scared our poor audience half to death, but that is such a valuable lesson that look where you are today and look what happened at the beginning. My mom used to say a bad beginning means a good end. It sure sounds like that happened for you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you to help me give a gift to our listeners. Our listeners are primarily educators and makers. What if yep. we had somebody who's going to be planning a virtual event. And I'm gonna give you a choice of what kind of an event it is. Let's say we have yep. this person who's a one person team, as I know a lot of people are these days. They right. have to do an amazing virtual event. They could do a family party, they could do a community nonprofit event, or they could do a webinar. Let's choose one of these and okay. step through the principles that you teach. So that's a great, great question. Can I throw in a fourth option? One sure. that's like in my head? Okay. Sure. So, um, there's a group of high schools in the area that we've done events for and they, they used to do in-person pep rallies for the teachers before the school year would kick off. And so a fourth option could be what if someone wanted to plan a pep rally for their teachers? Nice. Let's, go? Yeah, let's do a pep rally. You're the one okay. person who's going to do it. Where do you Got start it. and what do you do? The place to start, um, I'm actually, it's funny, I'm actually writing uh, and working on my, editing my first book, which I'm excited about. And I go through this five step process where you plan and produce an event. And so step number one is to determine the purpose of your event. I say pick the purpose. And so really what we wanna ask is why are we hosting it? And beyond why are we hosting it, why is someone going to show up to it, right? Why is someone going to attend it? Because here's what's going to happen is our audience is going to ask themselves either consciously or subconsciously, if it's a little bit on the boring side, they're going to be asking like, why am I here? Or if they're forced to be there, they might be asking, why am I here? And so picking the purpose of your event is really the first step. So asking questions like when people are logging off of their computer, if it's a virtual event, what do you want them to be thinking about? What do you want them to be feeling? And what a week later, what do you want them to be talking about when they share that memory with their friends or their family or whoever it is? Because um, an event today is going to be a story tomorrow. And so really starting with the purpose. So that's step number one. And then step number two is to create an outline for your event. So now that you have like the purpose, then it's, it's kind of like building a house is what I equate it to. You, the, the architect is gonna design a blueprint. So the outline is the blueprint of your event. So it doesn't mean that you have to have the curtains picked out and the paint colors picked out, it, but you need to have this general idea of what's going to happen because you know why they're gonna show up and why you wanna host the event. So if it's a pep rally for their teachers, why you're hosting that is because you want them to be excited. And then if they're showing up, you have to know that there might be multiple reasons why they'd be showing up. Maybe they're, they're forced to. That is one. They're being asked to. So knowing that is powerful. Knowing that some people are going to want to show up because maybe they feel disconnected from their other teachers and they want to connect with each other. 
So knowing these couple of things, or, or maybe someone wants some brownie points with their principal because they're hoping to get either a promotion or to get team leader within their grade level or, or move from one grade level to another. And so knowing these things, we can create the outline and say, okay, we're gonna, I usually tell people like when they're planning an event so that you can start collecting registrations, start with the very basics, the date, the time, the start time, the end time, and then like the name of the event and like a tagline to, to communicate why you're hosting it and why they should show up. And so starting with the purpose, then creating an outline. And if I were to host a pep rally for teachers, I'd make a virtual one. I'd make it no longer than an hour. I would start off with at least five or 10 minutes pre-show and you're playing, have a light playlist playing. And then like you can screen share with your camera off if you want to, if you're doing it through like a, a Zoom type platform. And then it's so about five or 10 minutes, just some light music and that, that makes sure that you have Zoom up and running. You can double check all your last things. Do a five or 10 minute welcome. And in that welcome, I would do an icebreaker. Have people just type where they're tuning in from in chat. And that just breaks what's called the fourth wall between you and the audience. And then I would maybe have, if it's for a specific school, say it's for an individual school, have the principal give a five minute or a 10 minute welcome. And then I would go straight into, hey, if they're there because they're feeling disconnected, go straight into a five minute breakout room where you send everybody randomly to breakout rooms. You can make it easier on yourself organizationally and do random, random assignments. So uh, about four or five people, because that gives about a minute a person. And you can do breakout rooms for about five, minutes or so and then bring everybody back together and ask a couple of people on the zoom and say hey what did you talk about and when you ask that question and you send them to the breakout rooms make sure to have a question prepared so generally going through i like to we like to plan in about five ten and then 20 minute chunks of time for a virtual event so five minute welcome ten minute welcome ten minute talk twenty minute activity five minute activity, like breaking it up and keeping it in short segments makes it feel like there's movement within it. So creating the outline is super important. And then from there, you can start to what I call refine the plan. So the third step is refining the plan. Now that you have your blueprint, start to gather the pieces. What computer is it gonna be on? Can I make sure to hardwire into internet? What microphone am I gonna be using? Who's gonna be speaking at what time? going through with a fine tooth comb, making sure that this person who's speaking then knows that all they have to do is just give it back to me since I'm facilitating the event. So refining the plan is an important key piece. After you refine the plan and you feel like you're in a good your place, then you're gonna move into the, well I call it prepare for success. So you are literally preparing to produce your event. And then the final stage, so preparing is now that you know what computer, Make sure you have that computer and you've like wiped all of the apps that you need and closed out everything and you're, you're building the slides and you're meeting with people to prepare for the event. And then the last one is to produce with excellence. So those are really the five steps that we go through every single time with our clients, with our own events. And it's been really helpful for us. What do you find is most effective if you have an attendee, when you get back to that, why are they attending? Who? Well, I don't wanna to go to this pep rally, but I have to go. Yeah. What kind of an engagement works best to get them into it? That's a great question. I'd go back to something simple like just typing the something in chat. So we actually have a couple of great icebreakers on our YouTube channel. And one of them is called This or That in Chat. It's really easy. And all you do is you give them two options and say, hey, if you were going to plan a summer vacation right before school starts, would you go to the beach or would you go to the mountains and have people just put either beach or mountains in the chat? And so what's interesting is it's kind of like if you imagine being at an in-person event, if someone's kind of sitting there and they've got their arms crossed and they're leaning back, they're kind of skeptical, the old, like you're not trying to get them from that posture to like dancing because that's too <laughs> big of a leap, right? The only thing that you want to do is you want to get them just to go from like this to where their arms are uncrossed and they're simply smiling. And so one way to do that is to ask them a certain question like what I just gave as an example and have them to interact because they have, they're, if they're on their couch, they're literally going to be leaning back like this and then they have to lean forward and type something in and they're gonna be thinking about a vacation at either the beach or the mountains and they're gonna be reading what their colleagues are doing too and they're gonna be smiling. 
So you can ask some fun, a really fun, simple question like that, and we call it um, an all skate. It's a lot like going to a skating rink, and sometimes there's people on the side, and then they say, oh, all right, we're gonna have a race of just the boys and then girls are next, or something like that. And then now it's gonna be an all skate. Everybody come in together. And so those are some of our favorite ones. Wow, that really is an ingenious way of subtly getting them away from that mindset of, I don't wanna be here to, oh, well, I think I'm going to go to the beach, et cetera, things like that. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to throw a shameless plug in here right now, because first of all, you mentioned your book. What's the uh -huh. title and when's it going to be released? <laughs> that is a great question. So uh, the title, the working title, it's not finished yet. The working title is uh, called Shattering the Fourth Wall. And do you know what the fourth wall, do you know what that concept yeah, is? Yeah, my background's in theater. So fourth wall, if I have this right, it's yep. going to be the wall of where you're performing and you're on the stage and the yep. audience is your fourth wall. Yeah. So that's exactly, it's that imaginary wall between the stage and the audience. Like if you were to go to a play, there's two side walls and there's a back wall behind the actors. And then the fourth wall is the imaginary wall between the, the stage and the audience. And so our, our bread and butter as a company for the last 10 years has been to do something that shatters that fourth wall between, we don't want to just want to break it. Like I want that thing like tumbling down in pieces to where it can't be assembled again because if the audience feels a part of the event and then the stage feels like it's actually resonating, like people know what you're talking about, it's just gonna be more effective at having people be engaged, they're gonna feel fun. It's the reason why like you go to concerts and why people get so excited if like this large musician, like this really well-known musician goes to the front and starts like high-fiving people if you were, can remember back to when that was actually, we were allowed to do that, right? Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so it's called Shattering the Fourth Wall, and the release date is TBD. So I'm still I'm in the editing process right now. People can probably find that on your website, seanspc.com, when it comes out. Uh, yeah, if you want to follow along with me, you can go to seanspc.com. LinkedIn is where I'm most active socially also. Definitely LinkedIn. Just talking about the stage, I'm looking at you right now on Zoom and seeing... Yeah a setting that I'd be reacting to very positively. Would you talk a little bit about getting a setting that's going to get people comfortable as we do this pep rally for teachers? That's a great question. So we recommend for virtual events, if you're a presenter or someone, there's really three options that you can have. There's a solid, simple, or studio, right? So the solid would just be a solid wall. So even in my home office, I'm right now sitting in our studio at my place of work, and this is where I've got a TV monitor behind me. I've got a nice plant. I've got lights. I've got a light over here, a light over here. I've got camera one, camera two, camera three, which I'm not switching between and multiple microphones. But for you, if someone's playing their own virtual event and they're doing this from home, we recommend starting with just a solid wall. And that's, again, when I'm at home, it's just a plain wall with like even no artwork. Then if you want to go a step up from that, a step up from that is something simple behind you. So a simple bookshelf or a simple piece of art, something not too cluttery, but less is more kind of thing. And then after that, then you would go to another step up from there is like what I have here, which is a studio. Which by the way, has very warm colors, the plant that you recommended, <laughs> that you referenced rather, and the Elevate logo, which is really fun. Yeah. What do you find are some of the mistakes to be avoided when people are doing a virtual event? What are some of the main ones people make when they start? Oh, so, that is a great question. The most common mistake that we see is people talking to their audience and not talking with their audience. So if I'm in the car with my wife and we're driving somewhere and I'm talking to her, then it's just a one-sided communication and my wife is not going to be happy with me, right? And so talking with someone is different. That means that you are talking for a bit and then you're getting some sort of interaction or feedback and they're communicating with you in some small way. So making sure to interact, even if you're doing a pre-recorded session, you can still pre-record it and even during while you're recording, say, hey, in chat right now, I want you to type in this and make it feel as if it's live and get them to interact in some way. So that's number one. And then number two is don't overcomplicate it. For it to be, you don't have to have virtual reality. If you're, this is your first event virtually, 
don't overcomplicate it to where you have to do virtual reality or augmented reality or something super complicated. Something like this or that in chat, y'all, I promise, like, if you're listening to this or watching this video, this or that in chat, something simple about giving people two options of, hey, coffee or tea, or milk or cookies, or pizza or tacos. Like, even as I say these things, the listeners right now, they're probably thinking, oh, I would pick pizza. Oh, I would pick milk instead of cookies or something like that. So it's just, you can make it engaging through some really basic elements. It's amazing to think how easily simple works. You have this on your video channel. You say team cat or team dog. I'm going, meow. <laughs> so I wanted to be sure and give also Elevate Experiences website. And you have a bunch of free resources. Would you mention those as well, please? We do for sure. So um, yes, I work for a company called Elevate Experiences. We're based out of Atlanta area. And our the entire center of the bullseye for us is helping people create events that their audiences will love. And so you can find us online at elevateexperiences.com or if you want, we've got like, we call it the one link to rule them all. It's kind of like a Lord of the Reference theme. And you can go to elevate.tips, elevate.tips. And from there, you can navigate to our YouTube channel where we've got tons of videos for icebreaker games as well as uh, best practices for virtual events. And then we've also got a link to another, it's on our website, but virtualeventsecrets.today will take you straight to, hey, we used to do some event in person and now we have to do it virtually and we need some help. And so there's blogs and videos available there as well. Talk about troubleshooting for a minute. You had that experience with getting locked out. Heaven forbid people do this event and something goes horribly wrong. How do you come back? So it just happened last night. We had a virtual game show and using this trivia platform called Crowdpur, and that's crowdpurr.com is where it can be located at. And I'm not getting paid for that, by the way, but I should be the, the amount of times I talk about it. And we had the, what's called the projector view. So you, when you do trivia, like people log in on their phone and then they uh, go to a website, log in on their phone. And then we, as the producers of the event, we can have a projector view where we can see their answers coming in in real time. We can show the correct answer. It's got a countdown timer. It's super cool. Well, we didn't reset it because we did two different game shows back to back for two different groups of people. And we didn't reset it with the new projector view for the new audience. And so it took probably about two minutes of troubleshooting to make sure that we had it up. And so there's two kind of approaches that you can have. If something screws up, if something messes up in your virtual event, and basically the audience don't notice it, you don't need to call it out. If they don't know nothing's wrong, <laughs> then you don't need to say anything's <laughs> wrong. So that's number one. Um, number two is if you have an instance like mine that happened last night, just apologize and say, hey, I'm having some technical difficulties. Let me work on this. And, and I was the MC of the event and I was talking them through it and we had some light music playing uh, with a DJ that we had in our studio. And then it literally took a minute and then I just went straight into it. I didn't address it and I just kind of moved on. And it's, I've never had an audience give me a hard time for having a technical difficulty. I love that. And they're probably the same audience that are going, oh, my computer is going down, things of that nature when they try to do something. Sean, exactly. if, people, if people could only get one thing from you about innovation, creativity, and making a difference, what would you want them to take away from your work with Elevate Experiences? The one thing I'd want them to walk away is that everyone, literally everyone on the face of the earth is creative. They're just creative in different ways. My boss, the way that he creates is with a blank, he wants to have a blank uh, piece of paper or a blank whiteboard in order to just dream and come up with tons of possibilities. My brain, I think of what I, the, the context of what I know, and I like to start with a template. And creativity, creativity really is solving a problem. Like a musician, wants to hear a melody and so they're solving a problem of what notes and what words and what harmonies a artist with a blank canvas is solving the problem of i want this to look like something and so matching with the colors and the strokes and the different brushes and all those kinds of things 
So if you if you're thinking about your and you're want, you're like I'm just not a creative person. That's just not true. And what I want you I want to challenge them to think about is when is the last time they helped someone or they did it themselves? They just solved a problem, because that is creative. That is creativity at its finest. Sean, thank you for your time today. Well, thank you, Dot. I appreciate it. This has been so fun. Mm-hmm.